Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think you know why you're here, uh, but let me introduce Mr. David Barkley to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Mike Balsam, by the way. I am a host of um, Your TV or Kojiko and uh, also on Giant TV. Uh, but of course, you're not here to uh, meet me. You're here to meet David <laughs> and talk about uh, all of his work on Star Wars, Fraggle Rock, The Muppets, The NeverEnding Story, and all of those other great franchises. So, uh, David, I'll, I'll begin and we will open the floor for questions uh, in a few moments. Um, but. Can I start by asking you a few questions? Absolutely, yes. How, yes. Did, how did you get into this gig of being a puppeteer, creating puppets, operating puppets? How did you get into that? Well, I had the perfect excuse. My parents are puppeteers. Oh, what? <laughs> so I grew up as a child think it was completely normal to be a puppeteer, <laughs> to make puppets. So I started operating string puppets when I was four um, and then started making puppets when I was six. My seventh birthday present was a traditional English Punch and Judy puppet theatre and puppets for a seven-year-old, because that's what I really wanted. So it was, it was pretty crazy. I was, yeah, definitely a puppeteer from, almost from birth. <laughs> well, it's funny too, because you know, I have two of my own kids and you know, that's one of those early toys that you buy for your kids, but they tend to, you know, it, it doesn't become something that they stick with. They yes. go from toy to toy to toy, but you probably didn't have that option. Well, I mean, I, I saw my parents, because uh, they did everything. They wrote the stories, they made the puppet theatres, they made all the puppets. Uh, they were originally actors, so they did all the voices, and um, so it was just the two of them that did all the work for all the puppet shows. And so I grew up thinking that was normal too, so that you, you do the sculpting, you do the puppet making, you do the moulding, you do all the costumes. I remember, uh, I have a vivid memory of six actually sewing through cloth making a costume for a glove puppet. Um, so, and they were very sort of, they had a very good work ethic and so I learned that very early on. <laughs> did they take their puppet making and their puppet theaters onto a wider scale like you did? No, they didn't interestingly enough. No, they, they sta stayed with traditional like glove puppet style which is kind of how they do Punch and Judy but they had all original stories, original puppets. Um, and they, we would do um, puppet shows in the Royal Parks in London, so we would do two shows a day, and so I spent all my summer holidays in, in England uh, working with my parents doing these shows. Um, so I, I, I did thousands of uh, puppet performances before um, wow. I ended up working in, in the, uh, the movie industry. And, um, but I did get to the point where it's like, no, I don't really want to do what my parents have done, which is the live shows, because I've done that all my life, at, at the grand age, age, age of 18 or something. I've done thousands of performances. I wanted to get into television and film. So that was, my, that was my dream. And what did they think of your step into television and film? It's something that they, it was, it was a new frontier that they hadn't ventured into. And obviously, you know, such a, such a bigger scale than working in a park. Yes, absolutely. Um, the one thing that's marvelous about doing your own show is you have complete control over everything you do. And from the artistic point of view, that's amazing. Obviously, when you work on a film, you're part of a team and you have to fulfill your, uh, the jobs that you are doing and you, there's usually people above you telling you what to do. So that's the difference. But um, yes, no, they both were very delighted that I got into films and actually I got to, with a, within a good few years, I became um, chief puppeteer or animatronic supervisor, so I was the head of department, so I could actually employ my father. Uh, my mother generally didn't, didn't <laughs> join in, um, she had some medical problems at that time, but my dad would come in, so we, we joked that we should probably set up a company called Dave Barclay and Father. <laughs> <laughs> What was that? What was that moment like? I mean, you know, like I, I my, my dad was a, a golfer, and right. I, I never beat him in a single round of golf before <laughs> he passed away. So I never reached the height that he did in in my golf game. What was it like when you knew that you sort of had more success than your parents did in this career? Well, I was I felt very lucky to be honest. All I had so many lucky breaks. Um, 
if you believe in puppets gods, they were definitely with me, you know, they would... I think we're all puppets of God, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, they, they were really, I had some amazing lucky breaks and they were just delighted for me. And, um, but yes, yeah, so I think with my, um, the, everything that they had um, introduced me to, including some of their puppeteer friends, I did go and work for some of their friends um, that became my friends. And so I, I worked in other puppet um, companies when I was a teenager. Um, so I, I gained a lot of experience before I started the movies. So, um, and there really wasn't anything like animatronic puppetry in films until Yoda. And I was so lucky to actually get on the first step of the ladder by being on Yoda on Empire Strikes Back at age 19. Wow. How did that happen? Well, um, I took a gap year from school when I was 18 and had a summer job. Um, I was selling the toy string puppets I used to work when I was four. I was selling those in a toy store for a summer job. Uh, I went out to lunch. I came back. Mark Hamill had been in. He bought $2,000 worth of the string puppets. Um, I was an enormous Star Wars fan because the first one had come out. And it's like... I was so depressed because A, I missed meeting Mark Hamill and B, I missed the commission on the puppets. <laughs> you know, so it's like, oh my God. So that was like the worst day of my life sort of thing. Um, but a year later, he got back in touch with Hamley's, the, the, the toy store, who, because um, he'd actually asked when I was out at lunch, was there someone who could make a string puppet of Darth Vader for him, a custom built puppet? And they said, yeah, the guy who's normally here can do that. So a year later, he got back in touch with the toy store then they got in touch with me. I got to actually meet Mark, which was amazing, meet, meeting Luke Skywalker. Um, he was an absolute sweetheart and lovely, lovely man. And he commissioned the, um, the Darth Vader string puppet, which I made for him. Uh, when it was finished, he invited me to Elstree Studios, where they were filming um, Star Wars films, because it was all filmed in, all the studio work was in London, so it, that's why it, was, it worked for me. So I went along to the studio, which again was just like, mind-blowing time. Oh, I was actually seeing some Star Wars. And um, it was the day his son was born. So, I mean, just again, he was, in, he was on cloud nine. Um, he introduced me to Stuart Freeborn. And Stuart is the makeup, was the makeup artist of um, all the Star Wars films. He created Chewbacca, he created Yoda and Jabba and all of that. So, um, so I met Stuart and um, uh, showed him what some of the work I'd been doing in special effects, prosthetic makeup and puppetry. And, um, and he said, oh, 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 that's very good. So um, it was lovely meeting him, and I didn't think much about it. A week later, I got called in. They offered me a job to work on Yoda. Wow. Can I ask, what did Mark Hamill need a Darth Vader puppet for? Was he bringing that to the studio, or was it no, something no, he was doing for, on his it own? Was, it was for private personal collection. Um, <laughs> okay. Mark, Mark loves puppets. Really? Which is one of the reasons, I think, one of the strong reasons why Yoda and uh, Luke work so well, so well together yeah because yeah. I, I i have worked with some actors which i shall not mention who are oh, puppets no no and and they they really don't want to engage it's no it's a puppet and they look they, they're not happy with it mark was like oh this is great and so mark working with frank oz with yoda was just magical and and they had a great rapport that between them and i think that's really part of the reason why yoda is so successful because of mark and that led to more work with Frank Oz and Jim Henson as well? Yes, yes. Well, yeah. So I, I got to meet Frank. And um, after we'd worked, finished on Empire, um, Jim Henson and Frank Oz were uh, in the development stage and the pre-production stage of Dark Crystal, so, which was just an amazing, amazing film. But So I finished um, working on Empire Strikes Back. A couple of months later, I went along for an interview um, for, for Dark Crystal um, and met Sherry Amott, who was heading up the production for, of all the puppet characters. Um, I was the first British person there. It was, it was a, a British workshop, and they, they set up in Hampstead. I went along there as the first uh, interviewee and uh, got the job. <laughs> and so I was there, first, the first Brit on Dark Crystal, and I did things like sculpting the mystic feet. Um, I built an initial mystic harness for the performers to work in. I worked with, a, who's a very good friend of mine still, Lyle Conway, to um, co-sculpt the Skeksis. I sculpted the Urskex, 
and worked on the puppet building on all of them and on Augra. So we worked as a big team building 27 puppets in nine months. When, when you get a job like that, how much of the finished product is your vision and how much of it is directed by the creators of the franchise, Dark Crystal, for instance? Yes, well, Dark Crystal had a conceptual designer, Brian Froud, and Brian is just the genius, and he, he did thousands and thousands of amazing illustrations, drawings, and, and even just little sketches to uh, let everyone know in which direction to go. But he was also very flexible. He would see things, he was in the workshop every day, and he would see the sculptures um, grow as they were being developed, and he would give great inputs to that. So, yes, the, the, the artistic um, look behind it all was definitely Brian Froud. Um, somebody like Lyle Conway put his own style into Augra, let's say. Augra's got this lovely face, and so his beautiful sculpting style was interpreted um, um, Brian's designs. Um, but then there was also, how do you turn this into a puppet? What's the best way of making this an extremely lightweight, durable, expressive puppet? And that really hadn't been uh, done at that level ever before. Yoda had been done. He was. He had his eyelids and eye movements and some ears, which, was, which made a big difference to keeping him like looking really realistic. But Dark Crystal, these were strange characters, so you had to f try different things. And so it was really interesting. Lyle and I got on very well. We had a similar approach as to how these puppets should be built. And so, yeah, so we, we spent a lot of time, I personally spent a lot of time making things incredibly light because being a puppeteer myself, I knew that you're gonna have it above your head for the all day long, so you want it the lightest, is lightest it can possibly be. So that's a physical job. It is. It is. Yeah, and it it, it often wrecks uh, havoc on people's bodies. I bet. <laughs> Do you have a situation that you can remember where you have created a puppet, but somebody else worked as the puppeteer, and, and how did you feel about that? Did you? Did you stand back and look and say, well, that's not the way I would have moved that puppet? <laughs> or did, were you lucky enough to usually get, the, get both roles on a film or a actually, television series? Actually, that's very interesting. Yeah, I was because I, most of the people that I work with, there's a, a couple of exceptions, but most of the people would either be working on the building side of the, of the puppets and animatronics or the performing. They would focus on one or the other. And Jim typically... Um, promoted that. He, he liked to keep the, the puppeteers really focused and the puppet makers focused, but he did allow me to do both. I was able to jump between the two camps, as it were, and so for a lot of the time I was able to build my own puppets, and so that I would build them to my strengths. Obviously, the things that I'm good at, I'd, I'd focus on, on that and build the puppets around that. So, and then if I would sort of start putting the puppet on and it didn't really work properly, I knew exactly how to fix it because it was going to be me. But no, I have made, we have, I've made a number of puppets that other puppeteers have, have performed. And um, they've all done an amazing job, actually. They've all brought their own style and personality to it because... Um, yeah, they're, um, I, I don't think I've, I've really worked with any puppeteers who aren't very good. Uh, they've all been quite ex exceptional. You bring up a good point. You, you mentioned having to fix something. So I imagine it's very common for you to build a puppet, uh, put it into action, then realize, well, that's not able to move the way I want it to move, so we've got to get it, get it back into the shop. Yes, I mean, one of the things is I, um, after working on the different films, and the films you really have a tight deadline and a very specific requirement for what you need to deliver, um, I set up a company with my good friend Mike Quinn, who also worked on he, um, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Return of the Jedi. He was nine numb in Return of the Dead Jedi. And uh, Jim Henson would always team us together. We worked together on Fraggle Rock, and he would always put us together on all the different shows that we did. Um, and so we decided to set up, set up our own company. Um, and we got a for some, some jobs uh, doing uh, TV puppets, uh, which uh, we had an amazing designer, a friend of ours designed for us, and um, which we built. Um, but it was like, it's, it's an interesting uh, dilemma for me because when I'm puppeteering, I sort of get into a different mindset. I have to be, I, I'm not a technical person when it's performing, I try and become, really get into the actor's mindset. 
and, um, and, and it's almost like a, a, a mental brain shift to get into puppeteering. So when something breaks, which has happened rarely, but when it breaks, you suddenly have to shift out of that into engineer mode. And it almost makes my brain hurt. Literally, physically, I almost got like a headache from trying to now switch my focus into this. So one of the things that we tried to do when we were setting up our company is make sure we could have zero downtime puppets. So we actually spent quite a bit of development and time making sure that the puppets were um, very reliable, that they weren't going to break, because pretty much every single puppet that we'd worked with at some point in the movies broke down at some point. And would, you, would you make a second puppet, a copy, to roll in as you're fixing another one? Is that... That was the theory, yes. We did that supposedly on Dark Crystal. I say supposedly because we never actually finished them. <laughs> uh, Lyle and I, we had the, the full set of Skeksis heads, and then we had a whole set of backups but the backups were never finished enough to go on camera. <laughs> we got very close, but they never ever got actually finished. So, um, so when things did go wrong, I, no, that's, that was a slight lie. We had two versions of the Chamberlain because he was such a um, the predominant character in the Skeksis. And um, so we had two versions of the Chamberlain, but only one version of every other one. So, um, but yes, yeah, so, um, so yeah, in the end, got to a point where we, we could build puppets and we knew they would last the production, so. I'm gonna ask one more question before we open it up to the floor. You mentioned the respect that you have for other puppeteers. Mm. Is it a very tight-knit community amongst, you know, the production facilities? Yes, it is, and that was, that's one of the magical things is that, um, and, and again, you get different teams of puppeteers who seem to gravitate to each other. It's like a sports team. You really have to, um, often, there's a lot of puppeteers working one character. Jabba, there was up to seven puppeteers. Um, I think the record is 65 puppeteers working Audrey 2 on wow. Little Shop of Horrors. And, and you were involved in that one. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Yes, that was that was an amazing amazing movie to be part of, and uh, and so and yeah, Frank, because um, I'd worked with Frank Oz on all the different films up to that point, and Frank asked me to come in and and work on the lower lip, um, because the <laughs> getting the lip sync right was was a real challenge, and it still holds up today. I think. I mean, we we had a lot of rehearsal. Um, and we actually shot the film in slow motion, as it were. We, we slowed everything down because we physically couldn't make the, the, the enormous plant puppet move quick enough. Right. So we, sl we sh uh, slowed everything down, um, filmed it in 16 frames, and then when it was projected, it sped everything up. Wow. Um, and so it gave a little snap, and, um, but it was all in camera. So, uh, yeah, so Little Shop was, was an amazing film, so. Let's open it up to the floor. If uh, you want to ask a question, just put up your hand, please. Yes, sir. Um, my sister couldn't be here this weekend. She's, um, her, like, greatest career aspiration is to work in the Disney Hunter Studios. Like, she just uh, she sent me with the question of, um, for somebody who's trying to get into the industry of public hearing, like, right now, what kind of advice would you give? Right, okay. I mean, I, I think there's, interestingly enough, when I started in uh, 79, in the movies, um, it was just the beginning of a huge uh, wave of animatronic movies all over the world. And that's, that wave has is, is died way down. There are a few movies, the new Dark Crystal TV series, which is shooting in London, that's one of them. And they do do some animatronic works on the new Star Wars in London again. Um, but there is a, a large um, growth and resurgence in live puppetry. And so the O'Neill Theater and also the Atlanta um, um, Puppet uh, Center, those are, are places that really focus on live puppetry. And the great live puppetry is getting a lot of good uh, reception and it gives you a lot of good experience. One of the reasons I had uh, the, my, as it were, lucky break to get into the Star Wars and um, work with Jim Henson was I had been puppeteering since I was four. And I had been doing that in a professional manner with my parents. It wasn't, I wasn't just playing at home. I would go home and actually rehearse four or five hours sometimes for something that I was doing the following day. So I, I took it very much as a job, uh, even as a child. <laughs> so um, if you're really passionate about it, then that is a great way to get your basic um, training and really get um, and find where your strengths are. Find the sort of things that you like to do. Are you more interested in building the puppets, performing, or doing both? 
Um, are you a storyteller? Um, do you like string puppets, rod puppets? Do you want to do the Muppet style? Um, there are some of the uh, Muppet puppeteers or people like us who have, have worked on all those shows that, that do train uh, puppeteers in that television style. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of good routes these days where when I started, there wasn't even a university degree in puppetry in the UK. So, um, and then the other side is just, um, I think Barnaby Dixon just did it on YouTube. He just did his own thing. He was so driven and got a YouTube fat, uh, travel, following on his YouTube channel. I can't say YouTube channel. Um, and, then, uh, and then I think he got uh, involved with the, the Henson Company. So... Um, so there's a, a lots of different routes, but uh, I think the passion for puppetry, um, if, if she really does have that, then that will, that will carry, carry her through. She just needs to keep um, focused. I was very lucky. I had a, a, a lucky break to get in when I was 19, but some of my other friends took like five or six years till they broke in. So, um, but if you're, if you're passionate about puppetry, I'm sure people will find out. Next question, yep. What was it like? It was marvelous working with Jim Henson. It was fantastic. Because I was that first British puppet maker and designer in, uh, puppet designer, in, um, on the Dark Crystal in November 1979, I got to have my first ever Thanksgiving because Britons don't do Thanksgiving. It's, that's, we're not, we not, aren't going to give thanks for that, <laughs> you know, the Brits. Um, but Jim did, and Jim and his wife Jane um, actually hosted a, a, a Thanksgiving at their house, uh, which all of us early Dark Crystal people were invited to. So got to really meet Jim privately, personally, as well as work with him a lot. And he literally... Um, w lived across the street. Um, so he would literally walk across the street into the workshop. That was one of the reasons he bought the house and the workshop at the same time. So he could just walk across the street to, uh, to start work. So we had countless um, hours of discussion. And in fact, when Dark Crystal wrapped, um, and basically the whole production was let go, all the puppeteers, all the production people, set designers and all of that, and carpenters, um, Jim Henson kept just two people on from the Dark Crystal puppet team to, um, to promote Dark Crystal and then to do research and development for what became Labyrinth. And those two people were myself and Lyle Conway. So we just stayed on. And because of that, again, we spent many, many lunches chatting to Jim. And in fact, Lyle was the person who said to Jim, hey, Jim, like, you've just let all these amazing animatronic people go off and work for other companies. Why don't you set up a Jim Henson creature shop? And Jim said, hmm, good idea. So, um, so Jim took Lyle's advice and the creature shop was born. So, um, so he was a, a visionary. I remember speaking to him, I think it was 1981, well before the technology was available to do digital puppetry. Um, so he had that dream, that vision, uh, and had many, many, many visions of many different things that he wanted to do such a terrible shock and shame when he died in, in 1990. I think every puppeteer who had been involved with Jim knew, knows exactly where they were when they heard that information. That's, that's, that's burned in our brains forever, and it was, just, it was just horrible. Myself and Mike Quinn and some other puppeteers were working on a TV show, and um, we just had to uh, stop production for a while. We just, we just couldn't carry on. So, um, And then... La, we sort of pulled ourselves together and, and got through the got through the day, but it was like it was unbelievable. So it was a terrible, terrible shock because he was such a a gentle and uh, just visionary man. So I remember <laughs> when when I first met him or the first few times working on Dark Crystal, I'd, I'd walk in. I say, "Oh, good morning, Jim." He said, "Good morning, sir." I was at the time I think I'd just turned twenty, and I thought, "Wow." How lovely to call, basically, a kid, sir. It's like, what a, what a generous, nice gesture. And, and what it did, what Jim was able to do, he was able to get the best out of everyone because he encouraged the best out of everyone. Um, and so, no, it was, it was a truly magical time. Um, I'm delighted to see that the, the, his children, um, 
who are now old people like me, <laughs> are, are, are continuing in his legacy. I, I'm, I'm really excited to see dark, the new Dark Crystal. I wasn't involved at all. Um, so I was busy on other stuff, so um, I almost had conversations about stuff, but it never, never actually worked out. It just wasn't going to happen. So, and I know most of the puppeteers who filmed it in London who had a blast, so I think it's going to be amazing. I think they're trying to keep that original essence of what we did 40 years ago. Um, and I believe um, Brian Froud, the same designer, is still overseeing all the creative looks, so it sh I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be phenomenal. It's hard to believe uh, Jim Henson's been gone almost 20 years. That's just unfathomable. Yeah. yeah unfathomable. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jess, your question? Yeah. Um, so 30, I think, isn't it? 1990. 90? Almost 30, you're right. Yeah. Yes, 30 years. Oh, man. Yeah. Can't do the math today. <laughs> Go ahead, Jess. Uh, Interesting. I still haven't seen it. I still haven't seen it. Um, I'm, I've, I literally have been working seven in the morning to eleven at night for about the last few years. So uh, unless I and I've even been missing crew screenings because I haven't been able to see them. Um, in, for instance, I didn't even see Team America that I worked on, which is also another lewd film. So I don't know. I mean, I think I think it's. Uh, I think there's. Certainly, I've seen some amazing adult puppetry in, in theater that really works amazingly well. Um, I think in film, um, it, it's, you have to find your market and you have to find where is the, the level of taste and sensibility. And what I've heard, although I didn't see the film, I heard that perhaps they went a little the wrong side of the taste and sensibility. But I've heard a couple of other people say they thought it was fantastic. So I guess it depends on who your audience is. And, um, but I guess in their way, they're also trying to do what Jim did, which was push the boundaries of puppetry. So um, I guess that's... That's something they've tried. If, if it wasn't financially successful, which I don't think it was um, after that, then, then it's going to be harder for someone to do something like that in the future because typically it's all about raising money to make these things. But um, um, I think probably the, the, the counter of that will be, I think Dark Crystal is going to be quite astonishing. So I think, did the young lad yeah. there have a question in the Superman hat? Yeah. <laughs> No, no question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you seen Avenue Q? I have seen Avenue Q. Oh, and I was, I was amazed. Actually, I went to see it with a, a puppeteer friend of mine, Bruce Lanoyle, and Bruce and I had, have puppeteered. We did things like Mr. Tinkles on Cats and Dogs, and we've, we've done some, some, some fantastic uh, movie characters. And he knew some of the puppeteers in it. And I know Rick Lyon, and Rick Lyon is the guy who did Trekkie Monster, designed and built all the puppets. So we were in New York doing a commercial, and I, I said to my friend Bruce, we've got to go and see um, Avenue Q. And he said, no, it's puppets. It's like, it's, it's working. We, I want to re relax, you know. It's like we're doing puppets all the time. It's like, I said, no, no, we've got to go and see it. And he said, oh, I don't know. He can't be that good. It's like, so we, um, we, we actually got in touch, and they said, no, no, we, we, we've, uh, there was... We actually bought the tickets, um, but then I let Rick know that we were we were we were coming, and the the the, the house wasn't completely full. So um, Bruce, being Bruce, says, "Oh no, I'm not sitting up here." And so he just went right down. We were in some really good seats because people hadn't turned up. So it's like so we we got good seats, although we didn't necessarily pay for them. Um, uh, and then we watched the thing, and both he and I were absolutely mesmerised by it. And talking about adult puppetry, I think that was flawless. I thought that was flawless. I thought the, the sense of humor, the comic timing, the performances, the way you had the puppeteers working with the puppets next to them and looking, at, uh, looking around and not quite ventriloquism, but I, actually, no, I think they brought them forward so that, they, that you were focusing on the puppets rather than on the person. Um, beautiful, beautiful work. And, um, and it's been going for, for many, many years. And I, th I think I, I noticed that r I think some of Rick's puppets have now gone into the Smithsonian um, Museum because um, they're so iconic. So it's fantastic. Another question? Yes, uh, Lady in the Hat. What are my favorite materials for building puppets? 
Um, basically, foam latex. Um, I've been working in, and that's typically for movie puppets. Um, doing any sort of uh, Muppety type stuff, I like a four way um, natural fiber fleece. Um, so the four way stretch for me is really important because you, you get the right movements and you can really get nice shapes and you don't have to do lots of seams if you're doing fabric puppets. For doing animatronics in movies, um, there was a push to do silicon. It became the rage that you do a silicon face. Uh, and I would uh, sort of have the two uh, references of Empire Strikes Back Yoda, which is foam latex, and episode one Yoda, which was silicon. I don't... Uh, so I like foam latex. <laughs> And so, yes, when I, when I had my, my company with Mike Quinn called Ultimate Animates, um, again, one, one of the things that my father did, he came and ran all the foam latex for us. He just loved doing that. He's like quite, he was quite the, uh, the scientist and uh, would really enjoy doing that, getting it. We, had, we en ended up developing our own foam specifically for TV puppets that would last forever. And then really nice, flexible um, animatronic stuff for movies. So... Um, and then, yeah, just keeping everything as light as it possibly can be, so. No problems with the hot lights on a television set with the latex? No, no, this is a foam latex. So this is, is originally, I, can, I could bore everyone to death, but it was originally developed for uh, Wizard of Oz many, many years ago for the scarecrow makeup and the um, cowardly lion um, by a makeup artist's brother who was a chemist. So they specially done for this film and then that, basically is what we're still using now. Um, and so it's, it's an amazing material, um, and it's, I think, pretty much most of the puppets I've built are, are being built out of foam latex. So. Uh, the gentleman here, uh, right in front of the uh, lady with the hat, yep. Um, what are some of the favorite puppets you created, and also did you work on Jack Blue Super White Hall? Mm, did I work on? No, I didn't, unfortunately, no. That's, I, I, I remember hearing about it. No, I didn't work on that. Um, what my favorite puppets? Well, um, I've, I've had favorite puppets that um, I haven't built. Um, I did contribute to building Yoda. I sculpted his top lip, and I made some of the mechanisms and punched hair into his head and, and seamed the top of his head. So I was part of the build crew on Yoda, so Yoda's got to be one of them. Um, and um, loved working Didymus in Labyrinth. So Didymus was just amazing. Um, that was a, a beautiful, a, and again, another Brian Froud design. He came up with the design. Um, I think Jane Gutnick did the sculpture of the face, um, and she did a beautiful job on that. So really enjoyed working on the building of, of, of Didymus and then performing him on the film. That was great. Loved that. Um, and then uh, I've built a, uh, dozens of puppets for different films. One of them that we really enjoyed was Mr. Tinkles from Cats and Dogs. Um, he was originally, they said, oh, we want six shots of him. He's going to be very, very grainy in the background. The rest's going to be computer animation, you know? And we saw some of the animation tests and we go, ooh, would you sort of look at all of that for the whole movie? So um, I, I persuaded the guys, to, let's make a more sophisticated Mr. Tinkles than they were expecting or paying for. And um, so we did. And we completed it and we put him on in front of the screen test and everyone was, was, was blown away by him. And, um, and so we basically filmed the entire movie with the puppet as well. So there were, there were shots with the real animal, there were shots with the CG, but the, the six shots turned from six shots into about, I think, 150, so, <laughs> so, and it was just, a, the, I think one of the reasons it was so success, successful while we were making it is because the rest of the film was the amazing Boon Na animal trainer working the animals. And so you would have an animal doing that, doing that, looking up, cut. Now they're going to add animation on top of it, and he's going to be saying a line here, saying a line here, saying a line here, and his eyes are going to look up. But when you're filming it, it's just a dog looking these directions. <laughs> so it's like we edit it together, and you go, well, is this going to be, well, is this film going to be any good sort of thing as you're working on it, I, I, I'd imagine. But then comes along Mr. Tinkles taking over the world as a puppet, and there's, oh, we can actually see how the film's going to work. 
So we were able to give them a reference of the arc of the character and everything with the puppets. And then we thought, oh, well, they'll probably cut loads of the puppet because we actually shot a lot of puppetry stuff that I thought, oh, no, that shouldn't be in the film because it looks too puppety. We can't really achieve what they want, but we're doing it so they've got lighting and scale for when they replace it with computer animation. Well, typically they didn't replace it. So, <laughs> which I guess is a compliment to the, to the work we so did. So it's a bit of a triumph, I, I would think, because uh, I mean, I, I think we believe that you know film producers think CGI can do just about anything. But you're telling us that here's a real instance where puppetry trumped. Yes. Sorry to use that word, trumped um, <laughs> CGI. Well, yes, interesting, yeah. I mean, this, this was a few years ago, and who knows whether that would still be true today. But we did have um, an amazing producer called Chris Defaria, and he, he saw the value in using the puppetry and getting the performances for, for that film. And also another um, director, producer, Brian Levant, did a, a film called Snow Dogs. And um, we built a, an absolutely pure... Um, copy of a real dog, it's absolutely photorealistic copy of a real dog, um, for doing things that the real dog wouldn't do or the trainers felt was too dangerous for the well-being of the dog. So, um, and so we got quite a few, we got uh, quite a number of shots in that film of, of, of the puppet. It, there is really quite a lot. And so we're having the crew screening and one of the producers who had stayed away from the shoot came up to Brian Levant, the director, and said, oh, fantastic film. And I'm standing there chatting with Brian. And Brian turns to the uh, producer, oh, what did you think of the animatronics? And the producer said, what animatronics? <laughs> And Brian said, that's the right answer. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. I'll go to you and then the, the young man in the back, and we'll probably close it off with you. All right, so go ahead. Yes, I mean, I think that was the, one of the big challenges was that now that no one had ever built a puppet like Yoda for that level of intensity and character and believability. Um, you'd had lots of monsters and the King Kongs and that sort of thing that were more maybe special effects, makeups and everything, but you didn't have some a, a character that had to deliver such a, a emotional performance as Yoda. And um, so it was a challenge. It was a big challenge. It was um, a challenge here on... Uh, Stuart Freeborn building him, I think they tried about two or three different sculptures. They had about 20 designs. They had two or three different sculptures until they got the final one to look just right. Um, and then there's all the me mechanical side that was all brand new, no one had done it before. Um, and then on top of that, Frank Oz had to find a style of puppetry, not like Miss Piggy and not like the Muppets, that would bring this guy to life. And um, interestingly enough, um, I wasn't part of the original puppeteer team. I was just working for Stuart in the makeup um, lab. But then one of the puppeteers was ill, and I was drafted in to take over the eyes. And then Frank liked what I did, so he said, would I stay on doing the eyes? So I did for the rest of the shoot. Um, but um, they, they discovered that after Frank had spent a little while working on the puppet, and we got to the Dagobah set, they looked back at some of the early rushes, some of the very first things that they filmed, and it just it didn't look right. It looked too puppety. Too look. So they said, oh, well, let's go back and reshoot that. So they went back and reshot some of it, and that was in the um, in uh, Yoda's house. So they went back and reshot some of Yoda to uh, make sure that it would the, the quality was consistent all the way through. And that was the thing with um, Irvin Kirshner. He was really determined to get the most out of Yoda. So we were never, there was, we never hurried along to get it right. He, he knew that if there was a bad shot of Yoda in the film, it could destroy the whole of the character. So every shot had to be perfect. A uh, young man at the back. Well, my favourite puppet, well, the, uh, yes, my favourite puppet easily was Sprocket the dog. <laughs> now, you, some of you said that you saw Steve Whitmire last year, 
and Steve originated the character of Sprocket on Fraggle Rock as they filmed it in Toronto. Um, but Jim Henson had this genius idea of you take the Doc and Sprocket segment, the actor and the dog, and you refilm it in different countries around the world, dub the, if it's a foreign language, dub the Fraggles and the Doozers and the Gorgs into that local language, and then you put a, a local actor from that country with the dog, and it suddenly looks like you've got a, a, a actually originated Henson show for a very small amount of money, because it only takes a little bit just to shoot the dock and sprocket. So it was genius. Again, another genius idea for Jim. And um, I saw, I was, we were, we'd finished Dark Crystal, and Lyle and I were doing all the development for, for Labyrinth, and also, um, what else were we doing? Yeah, we were doing the final uh, exhibition figures of Dark Crystal to go out in for, for long-term exhibitions. Um, we saw the very first pilot of, of Fraggle Rock, and um, we're looking at it, and it was, it was a little rough, the first rough edit of the pilot. It, it, they, they tightened it up and, and reshot some stuff, and it ended up being great, but the first pilot said, mm, that's okay, and then looking at the, uh, I said, oh, I love Sprocket, oh, I'd love to puppeteer something like that, oh, yeah, that's, that looks great, and... Um, the person who was showing us the stuff was the executive producer, Duncan Kenworthy. Um, he then mentioned it to Jim, and then Jim said, oh yeah, David can do the European versions. He can do England, he can do France, he can do Germany, he can do the Netherlands. So in the end, actually, I performed way more Sprocket than Steve ever did, but Steve started it off, you know. And um, the other side of that was that I absolutely adored doing um, Sprocket because we, it was puppeteered in three different styles. The Germans wanted it exactly like the original. So I had to be exactly like Steve Whitmire. The actor had to do exactly what Jerry Parks did. The set was the exact same size. Even the shots were the same. The Germans said, it's perfect. We can't improve on it. We, we are copying it. So that's what the Germans did. That was their, their mindset. The French was, oh, no, no, we can make this better and bigger and grander. So um, the actor was a chef. And Sprocket was called Croquette. <laughs> and it was like really big over the top sort of crazy puppetry that they wanted and big over the top acting from the actor, which was really fun and great for the country. But a very different style of puppetry for, for Sprocket than Steve's. Then in England, oh no, it has to be real. Oh no, very stiff upper lip. Oh no, you can't do all of this crazy puppetry thing. It has to be real. So, so that was really brought down almost to be trying to be a real dog. Where um, so it was reduced from Steve. So I, I got to play all these these different versions of Sprocket around the world for years. So definitely Sprocket was my favourite character. And last question. Um, how many hours did you film like, the puppetry? How many hours did it take? How many hours does it take to film the puppetry? Well, um, I think Dark Crystal we took us six months of round about 10 hour days, 10 to 12 hour days is normally what happens five days a week. Um, sometimes we do have to do Saturdays as well. So, um, so that, that was a long shoot. Um, Little Shop of Horrors, that took about nine months to shoot. Uh, every single day, full on. Um, we had a t full team of 16 puppeteers at the minimum for Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> so I was a team of 16. One of one of sixteen, and um, and then uh, something like cats and dogs with the animals. That was a six-month shoot. Um, so, so yeah, these these films can take a long time to make, and um, it's, it's just it is time-consuming. I think one of the things that Mike Quinn and I used to say when we had meetings with producers who wanted to do a puppet show. Uh, who'd never done it before. So, well, actually, don't think because you're going to do puppets, it's going to be quicker. Actually, it's, it takes twice as long as filming people because there are twice as many complications to set up each shot. You, you've got maybe usually two puppeteers um, working one puppet. You've got all the monitors. You've got all everything to set up, and you've got to rehearse, make sure they don't fall over everything. P people do that automatically and easily, but you actually have to work quite hard to make that happen with puppeteers. So, yes, it usually takes twice as long to film a puppet thing than it does an acting thing. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for sharing your time with us and shedding some light on this world of puppetry. It's fascinating. Um, let's hear it for David Barkley today. Thank you very much. Thank you.